Hi, this is your host, Sapil Bhartia, and today we have two guests with us, Matt Jarvis, Director of Developer Relations at Sneak, and Steve Hendrick once again, Vice President of Research at the Linux Foundation. Matt, Steve, it's great to have you both on the show. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Yeah, today we are going to talk about open source security report. We were supposed to do this show at Open Source Summit, but the, some plans changed, so we were not able to do it there. But you know, that's the beauty of you know online world. We can do it whenever we want to do it. So, uh, before we get started about this specific report, I would like to hear from both of you because you know you are here. Is how has the landscape for security changed in the open source world? I do recall in early days it was you know open source is ultimately secure. Then it was like open source is more secure, and now we are talking about no, we have to do a lot of things uh, to make sure that open source remains secure. So talk about uh, this whole <laughs> evolution or change in approach. Well, I think I would I would start by saying that open source security is a journey that pretty much every organization is on. They've been on it for a, a number of years and they're going to be on it for a number of years more. <laughs> it's it's uh, something they're going to have to attend to as part of the software development lifecycle for as long as they're developing software. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, Mark and Jason talked about software eating the world. You know, when we really look at that, at that quote, what's happened is open source software has eaten the world, right? And I mean, open source software has, has somewhat become a, a victim of its own success. You know, this ubiquity has meant that, uh, you know, it's become a target for, for bad actors. You know, uh, uh, attacking the software supply chain in open source ecosystems has become uh, easier than looking for zero day vulnerabilities in end user applications. I recall my discussion early with Sam Ramji when he was at Cloud Foundry Linux Foundation that he was like, you know, in five or six years from now, uh, when we talk about software, we won't even mention open source because by default, software would mean open source. So that's the direction we are heading into. So that also means that a lot of concern that come with you know any software that is with the open source as well. And the fact is that uh, there's nothing different between open source or proprietary. Bugs become part of software development process. And then when you deploy software, uh, human error, which is configuration, mixed configuration, that also lead to a lot of vulnerabilities. So this is not going to go away. And as Steve, you said, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a journey, it's a process, not a, security is never a product, it will always remain uh, a process. Now, let's go back to this uh, report. So first of all, talk about what is the goal behind this report? Well, let's see, um, we started down this path in March of this year. And in March, I did um, a number of one-on-one -on -one interviews with software maintainers and core contributors, uh, and subject matter experts, and trying to understand, you know, what direction we should take from the standpoint of the report. Uh, we went into the, we did the we did survey design and went into the field in uh, April. We did analysis in May and uh, post production uh, of the report in June. So, and the report was actually released in the middle of June at our uh, open source summit uh, in North America. So, um, as far as the objective, there were a couple of things we wanted to accomplish with this report. The first really was to understand, you know, what is the state of open source software security inside of organizations today? We also wanted to know, and essentially, how, how bad is the problem? Because I think we all will admit there's a problem. Uh, the second thing we wanted to accomplish was to um, get a read on where do organizations intend to go on their open source software uh, security journey, um, and how fast are they going to go there? A third issue was what are the what are best practices that are being followed by organizations uh, in the course of, of dealing with open source software security, and finally, questions about. Um, uh, uh, sustainability and resourcing from the standpoint of how better to manage uh, open source software security. So quite a, uh, quite a large uh, set of objectives for this particular uh, survey it was ended up being quite long uh, and painful for some of the maintainers that were kindly kind enough to contribute their, uh, their time. Um, but very productive from the standpoint of what it told us. Uh, Matt, if I ask you uh, from your perspective, first of all, I mean, of course, you folks specialize in security, but talk about uh, what was your role in this report, uh, how you folks were involved, and for how long have you, because we did talk to Steve when, before the, you know, the survey started, so we, we, we had a discussion, but I understand the sneaks, you know, participation here. 
Yeah, so I mean, Sneak have, have been uh, doing our own uh, state of open source security report um, pretty much every year since I think 20, 2018. And, um, you know, obviously the, uh, the, um, the additional uh, insight that we can bring is a very, very large uh, backend database of scanned open source projects uh, scanned using Sneak. So we can actually provide uh, data and insights into uh, the uh, makeup of, of, of many of these open source projects in terms of uh, how many dependencies they have, both direct and indirect, the amount of vulnerabilities that are in those uh, those pieces of software, and things like um, how long it takes to, to fix. So as well as, as co-authoring uh, the report with, uh, with Steve and the Linux Foundation, um, Sneak brought that data that data to uh, to the to the uh, to the report in terms of some of these statistics. Right, and as you know, Steve was talking about some of the you know uh, goals or you know kind of you know aims behind the report. From from if I look at it from Sneak's perspective, where you folks have been doing you know your own report for a while, uh, how do you see this report, open source security report? How does it kind of complement the efforts you are doing, or like to help the whole ecosystem in general to improve their security posture? Yeah, so I mean, as an organization, we're one of the uh, one of the members of the OpenSSF, and are clearly, you know, very engaged in in uh, the whole uh, kind of journey towards uh, better open source security. You know, as a, as a company, you know, our role is to help users have have better security around their their use of open source you know i mean the the software composition analysis piece in terms of open source dependencies is really where sneak started from and uh you know so it's it's in our interest to uh, to help the ecosystem uh, get better at this stuff and since you brought you know open up and which is also i'm kind of happy to see it's going on there but interesting thing is that all the linux foundation projects, if you look at CNCF or any other project, they themselves have their own focus on security. They have security tag, you know, spe special interest groups there as well. So talk about the role of OpenSSF, you know, uh, across the spectrum or, you know, across the, so, or I can, if I can rephrase the question is, what is the role of OpenSSF that you see there? Uh, is it going to complement the efforts that are going on? Is it going to consolidate the efforts? Well, I think realistically, um, OpenSSF, um, Open Source Security Foundation, um, is really the premier project of the Linux Foundation when it comes to looking at all things security. Um, that is the sole focus of that particular program. And I think Brian Bellendorf is doing a fabulous job at being able to steer that particular project in a whole host of different directions. Um, and his his advice to me was, listen, we need a we need a survey, and we need to be able to understand this, how significant the problem is, and you know how we're going to get solutions to it. Perfect. Uh, and uh, Matt, I would like to hear your opinion as well. You know, because you're also not only a member of Linux Foundation, you know, projects, but you're also kind of, you know, a vendor who's actually helping real users with real problems. So how do you see emergence of OpenSSF to help the whole ecosystem? Well, so, I mean, I, I think there's been a growing realization over the last few years that um, security was going to become a very big issue in, in open source supply chains. We've seen more and more um, uh, not just vulnerabilities, but actually malicious attacks in in package ecosystems. Whether that be typo squatting, whether that be um, um, you know malware and all that kind of stuff, and we've seen a dramatic increase in that over the the last few years. And you know that's that's kind of compounded by the fact that we are both creating a huge amount more open source software. You know, we talked right at the start about almost all software development in the world is 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 now. Uh, open source to to some extent, you know, uh, and um, the the amount of software that we're creating, you know, as a civilization is is increasing absolutely exponentially, and so all these things kind of form this this perfect storm of uh, you know needing to uh, look at uh, at open source security in a um, you know in a in a much more organized way, and I, I think there's been. You know, there, there's obviously been been uh, focus on that from the Linux Foundation before in terms of LFX security and that kind of stuff about providing security tools to um, to projects under the Linux Foundation umbrella. And you know, many of the the uh, the foundations under the uh, Linux Foundation have have had separate kind of uh, um, uh, projects to to try to improve um, 
uh, provide better um, security tooling to developers within their projects. So I think the the open SSF just be, has become a uh, you know the the kind of um, coalescence of of all of those things that have been coming together in our industry and in our ecosystems over the last four or five years. And you know, I mean, the goals of the open SSF are obviously you know uh, far reaching in terms of uh, of providing uh, security tooling to. You know, I think the top the top five hundred um, open source projects, as well as uh, a range of things available to to all open source projects, like the scorecard program and and things like that. So I think it was it, it's got a, somewhat of an inevitability about it that we were going to need a project like OpenSSF. We are creating a lot of open source, as you two folks, you know, <laughs> talked about. But the, the, the area is also how it's being used. Of course, we have SaaS, you know, where you can, but that's also security, AWS, Azure, Oracle, IBM, everybody has to care about that. Then we also have, you know, uh, software that is deployed locally. It's not running on any cloud provider servers. Then, you know, uh, we are also writing a lot of software that can go on the edge. And that's why you folks also have CD Foundation where, you know, it's because cloud is not everything. You know, there are a lot of software that is run locally. So, and all of those are consuming open source, but the challenges are also different in every space because we, we, we talk about where does the bucket stop? We talk about SREs. So can you also talk about how this changing landscape where the way we are, it's not just about creating software, but the way we are deploying and using software has also diversified, which also means the challenges are different. So uh, if I ask you both folks, you know, how do you look at this as a challenge itself, not just uh, uh, securing the code, but the deployment phase as well? Well, I think there's, um, I think the, the real takeaway here is that security needs to be a full life cycle um, activity. Um, there's a lot of focus these days on security from the standpoint of CICD, but Swap, as you were saying, um, you know, we are all connected by the World Wide Web. Um, so realistically, pretty much every and, every, and the focus today on building modern applications is to have them be web-based. So the reality is, is that security with only a small number of exceptions really does need to be a full life cycle activity for application development today. It just, you know, and whether it's, doesn't matter whether it's uh, API based or not, um, you still need to deal with security for every single one of those components. You have to be concerned about security that are part of your application portfolio. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, it's a, uh, it has become more complex to understand where your risk kind of boundary is. You know, and you're certainly, you know, you're certainly right in terms of, of, uh, of certain things, you know, is your cloud service provider responsible for that or are you? And you know that can become a, a, a complex line to draw about where that uh, where that problem is. Um, but you know, there's there's certainly risk associated with all those things. I mean, if we look at, at, at cloud platforms, I think people are only just coming to the realization that they have um, a, a potential risk from misconfigurations. Right? I mean, almost every almost every uh, major um, breach of the last, uh, you know, five, six years has been a combination of application level vulnerability and infrastructure misconfiguration. But if we go, if we went back three or four years, almost nobody was was doing security scanning on their infrastructure as code, right? And we're only just starting to see the emergence of uh, of cloud security posture management tooling, you know, which is about scanning your deployed environments. So I, I do think there is a there is a uh, 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 a double whammy here, if you like, of you know the the issues in in uh, understanding the issues in in consuming open source, but also these rapidly changing models of how we develop and deploy software. Steve, if I may ask you, uh, can you share you know what are some of the key findings, some data, some numbers you know that you collected through this uh, report? Sure. Um, well, first, let me give you just a couple of numbers on where we're at from the standpoint of um, adoption of, of tooling and uh, processes to deal with open source software security. <clears throat> first of all, uh, when asked if the organization has an open source software security policy in place, uh, we had 49% of the respondents said yes, 34% said no, and 17% didn't know how to answer the question. 
Um, so perhaps they weren't in a role that gave them, you know, easy, ready access to uh, the fact that the organization may or may not have a policy. So the 49% was a little disappointing, um, but you know, it's, um, it's, this is a work in progress. And if you actually factor out the don't know, not sure, it ends up being a 60-40 split with 60% having a policy and 40% not having a policy. Um, it turned out that small organizations you know, were more likely not to have a policy, as you might expect. They just don't have the resources and the cycles to be able to, to deal with everything. Um, from the standpoint of where we are overall with security, we asked another question, which is how secure is your open source software today? And so we had a variety of responses, uh, all mutually exclusive uh, and collectively exhaustive. And when we actually numerically scaled that information on a basis from zero to 100, the response was that we ended up with a 65 was the, the score across all the organizations in our sample. You know, if you think back to your time in school, 65 isn't a particularly good number. I didn't expect it to be a good number. We actually only had 16% uh, of organizations say, their uh, open source software was highly secure and 43% said it was somewhat secure. And of course the rest, that's 59% total. The rest, of, the rest of them basically were some level of insecure. So 65% today, that number was based on how we asked them questions about how is this, how do you anticipate this is going to change for your organization? That number will increase by about 11% to be a 72 this according to these organizations by the end of this year, because we did this survey in April. So a significant improvement uh, in just in less than a year. And then what's going to improve from 72% to 77% by the end of 2023, a much smaller 7% increase. So I, that's one of the reasons why I said this is clearly a, uh, a journey for organizations. Um, you know, in the next year and a half, we're going to improve significantly, but it's likely and really not to be enough uh, because security is one of these things can bring an organization to its knees. So, uh, so anyway, that's where we're at. And, uh, you know, we can go on and talk more about, if you like, about exactly what organizations are doing to, uh, to address this. Yeah, I would love to. I, I just want to look at these numbers also from Matt's perspective, because uh, uh, as much as we are talking of shift left, uh, but we are still seeing there are still silos, you know, there are teams, security teams. So when these kind of surveys are done, uh, I mean, it, it kind of leads to two different, kind of, first of all, that the teams are themselves not aware of what the security teams are doing. So, so there may be security practice already there, but they are not aware of that. Or second is the fact that, you know, no, there is nothing. So if I ask you, what do you, because in either way, both things are not very encouraging. Yeah, I mean, and I think if you're, if, you're, if you're asking developers whether they have a security policy in place and they don't know about it, well, that's as bad as having no security policy, right? Um, I, I think what it, ex, what it exposes is that it's, it, it's, it can be challenging to address these things, you know, even in large organizations, because, you know, Looking at, at security uh, around open source projects isn't just about looking at the code. You know, you kind of have to have an understanding of the open source development model because things like uh, the health of the community, the governance of that particular project, all play into whether you should be using that project on a long term basis to support your business, right? And I mean, we've seen examples over the uh, over the last uh, few months in the in the JavaScript community of these uh, these uh, protestware type applications, which um, were had a single maintainer, but decided you know unilaterally to 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 uh, make changes to that particular application to change its functionality or to I mean luckily most of those weren't weren't destructive, but I mean what it shows is the risk that. Uh, uh, open source projects that that don't have a healthy governance model can also be in terms of uh, of, of uh, uh, vulnerabilities and unexpected behaviors. So, um, yeah, I think it's a it, it can be a challenge for organizations to understand how they should be consuming open source. Right, Steve, do you have to add anything there, or? Um, well, I think that's a it's a it's a perfect um, setup for what organizations are intending to do. Uh, to help us you know, sort out this problem and, and improve their security posture. So uh, the first thing that organizations want to do, and this is by a significant amount, 
59% of organizations in the sample said they were looking for added intelligence uh, to existing software security tooling. Now, if you look at the market for security tools, uh, software security tools, there are probably about 10 different categories of tools. And of course, we all, are, we all know, and this survey confirmed that uh, SCA tools and SAST tools were the two leading categories, no, to no surprise. Um, however, do note that those two tools um, uh, are very focused on CICD, and so not as much focused on the tail end. Now, of course, much better to, to find problems before you go into production. That doesn't mean you don't want to scan, uh, scan software once it's in production. So, uh, so that was the leading um, way that organizations are looking to improve their security. Now, note that this is not, this does not include changes to process inside of the organization. Uh, this is essentially advocating part of what they need to accomplish and, and pushing it into the hands of the vendor community. Um, so our hope is that the vendor community is responsible, is attuned to these particular needs and does improve, the, and do, does improve these tools. Um, so that was the leading finding. The number two one, which I think is also really key here at 52% of the sample, were comprehensive best practices uh, and certifications for secure software development. Um, this is um, great to see. Uh, the best practices space when it comes to open source security or software security in general um, is fairly complex. Uh, there are a lot of different best practices that you can look to, and there are now frameworks emerging. Um, Salsa.dev is a good example of one. That's slsa.dev. Uh, so take a look at that if you aren't familiar with the Salsa framework. Um, Linux Foundation has one too from the standpoint of how you should adopt best practices. We, in fact, have a, a free course and certification. Uh, for secure software development, it's LFD 121. It's on the OpenSSF site. Um, these best practices, and there's about 150 in total, so this is not for the faint of heart, but these best practices are absolutely fantastic in helping you understand the scope across the life cycle of what the security issues are and help you identify uh, and confirm not only what you're already doing, but also those things that you probably should be doing next. Uh, well, that's, the, that's kind of the top two. Um, I, I'll just mention the, th the third ranked one at 49% was more automation to eliminate pathways to compromise security and reduce developer fatigue. Um, and by the way, IAC tools, infrastructure as code, uh, was the number three uh, used tool from the standpoint of addressing software security. And I'm sure it was all about uh, the automation across CITD. Because you know, less more automation means less manual touch points, less ways to uh, uh, basically do shortcuts that are sort of not security appropriate, um, and allow you to have more uh, loopholes to be able to be, uh, to, for, to be open to expo exploitation. Right. Excellent. Uh, since uh, there are a couple of things that you said. Number one, you're like, hey, vendors' responsibility, and then you know, uh, develop fatigue. <laughs> Sneak is here. Uh, I want to understand from your perspective as well. Number one is that uh, let's just talk about cloud native technology. They are already complicated. You know, uh, let's not even talk about how complex Kubernetes can be. Plus, a lot of things are moving to developers' pipelines. Earlier, it was hey, you write the application, you focus on adding business value. Now you have to also worry about not only maintaining it, keeping it running, also securing it. So a lot of things are moving into developers' pipeline, and we are not making things easier for developers. We are like hey, you know, you have to do a lot of more things now. And security is a specialized field, so that is that that is one factor there. We are already seeing burnout is happening. We are already seeing you know, retention is becoming a big challenge. Second is that. Uh, uh, automation he talked about and then uh, third is also cultural aspect so even when we look go back to the previous point of you know 65 percent of 49 percent it's also about the tools are there but how many everybody loves to talk about security but how much is it in practice so if you can just look at these three uh, problem areas and you can see that you do see a common pattern and how culturally it can be you know addressed yeah i mean i i think you've uh... You've identified some interesting points there, if I can sort of unpack that a little bit. I mean, because in a way, this problem isn't just about open source supply chain, right? Because at the same time as this, we've got this 
dramatic shift in in the industry about how we need to do security. You know, as you pointed out, it's moved towards uh, from from security as a gatekeeping function to integrating security into our pipeline so that we can maintain developer velocity. And you know, so uh, and that developer first kind of movement requires uh, different kinds of tools, right? Because we want to provide um, tools that give developers actionable insights in the places they work. And so, you know, um, successful kind of transformations in this way are about integrating security tooling directly into your software development lifecycle at every point. So giving developers insights into our, in their IDE, in the source code management system, in your CI pipeline, and then um, in production. And it's a different kind of insight from, you know, the uh, the, the traditional uh, big list of CVEs that, that security tools uh, used to produce because developers aren't security experts. So you, you have to, you know, actionability and remediation advice becomes a really key part of that kind of security transformation. And I, I think, you know, from the... Uh, from the um, the figures that Steve was referring to, you know, those those really uh, highlight um, the difficulties there are in in these transformations, and uh, because it's a it's a it's a very different uh, way of working. You know, we sort of have to transition our security teams into being toolsmiths and trusted advisors from being the the kind of old uh, gatekeeper function. And I, but I I think you also hit the nail on the head that you know the hardest problems in technology are always about people. So you know there is uh, there's there's definitely challenges that that we see um, working with organisations about uh, about cultural change around around security as well. I think now we have very well rounded and good discussion here, right? We talk not only talk about the report, but also we went deeper into identifying the problem areas and also kind of potential not solution, but yeah, kind of solutions toward that. So, Steve, do you think it's good uh, to wrap it up now? Yeah, yeah. No, I think uh, I think we've we've hit on all the high points. Um, I think I was just wanted to build on a comment Matt made about the tooling. Um, I think one of the reasons, here's a great example of how vendors could provide more intelligence into tooling to, to add value. Um, well, first of all, you know, increased automation in dealing with security issues is clearly uh, the path organizations want to be on because this will be the easiest way to reduce the workload on the developers themselves. Oh, but also when it comes to SAST and SCA tools, the, 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 there's a, a very strong need here to reduce the uh, number of false positives. And if vendors can get the number of false positives down, that will, gener that, will that means less noise and uh, easier for developers to focus in on what's really important. So that's just one simple example, but that, that is, I think, a really, good, uh, a really good reference to why improving uh, tool intelligence in the security space is so important. Yeah, and I, and I think that the, the other thing that's going to become increasingly important, and you know, this is just starting to emerge, is our ability to actually uh, sort of tie the different uh, viewpoints together, right? You know, we we can look into, into cloud environments, see how those things are configured, see where your applications are actually deployed, and, and give much deeper insight into whether a particular vulnerability is actually exposed or not. And uh, or, or and the, the the same in terms of code paths, right? Looking at whether is that code path actually executed, and and I think once we start as an industry to be able to uh, to link these things up and link these data sets together, you know, security tooling becomes a, a, a much more of an intelligent uh, uh, viewpoint across all of your deployed applications. Yeah, I think one more thing to add here, though, on on the tooling side is that right now, on average, across those organizations in our sample for the survey, uh, organizations were using 2.4 uh, tool categories. And as I said, there's about 10 or 12 different tool categories. The unfortunate aspect is that there are probably four important tool categories uh, that you know, top the list from the standpoint of, of, of penetration already to date. Uh, we've already talked about SCA and SAS tools. Those are both, you know, the, the, the leading tools in use. Behind that comes infrastructure as code, and then the DAST tools. Uh, so whether it's um, web application scanning or fuzz testing, uh, there are different flavors of DAST. But those are four tool categories that it seems to me are instrumental to being able to being involved in addressing open source software security. 
And what this suggests is that since we're only using 2.4 of these categories, and this doesn't even you know, uh, uh, address the, the, uh, the remaining categories, since we're only at 2.4, although at the risk of alienating developers, I think we really need to focus on adding more tools into to deal with the security issues that we have, uh, because we need more of a life cycle uh, approach to all of this. So maybe we'll get some back because of what IAC can do. And then of course there's IAC scanners as well. Um, but I just want to mention that because I think we really do need to use more tools in the security space, but we have to be respectful and find ways to do this in an efficient and protective way. Matt, Steve, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about not only this report was going in depth to actually also once again suggest uh, what is needed there. I think as you earlier said, you know, it's going to be a journey. So. I do hope that by the time you uh, come up with the next report, the number will jump from 49 to 99. That's what we're hoping for. Uh, but uh, uh, a lot of work has to be done in this space. Uh, so thanks for your not only your uh, insights today, but also the work you're doing there. Uh, and I look forward to our next discussion. Thank you.